Alright guys, what is going on? Look, I'm going to try and dive into this as quick as possible. I feel like I have a ton to cover with you today. Um, my name, of course, is Glenn. We bring you the freshest and tastiest in all the brews here at Brewed There, Drank That, All the Dales, whatever you want to call us. It doesn't matter. Uh, our goal, our mission is to change your everyday life one beer, uh, one one meal at a time, and uh, we'd like to think we do that quite well. Today I've got something super special for us. Um, I'm going to give you a little zoom in there. Tehenk it. Uh, I have heavily anticipated the release of this beer. It was first released as an experimental batch at the Brew Pub for Dogfish Head, uh, and this year enjoyed a full 750 release. Uh, this is part of their Time Capsule series. This is, of course, their take on the ancient Egyptian beer. Um, now, what I love is that uh, beer uh, has this insanely far-reaching grasp, uh, so far-reaching that it has, to the best of my knowledge, almost reset our archaeologic timetable. Uh, modern archaeologists would hold that we had barely come down out of trees and, and started living in, in communities, let alone brewing beer 10,000 years ago. And yet, more and more archaeological evidence and more and more beers seem to reflect quite a different story, saying that we've been brewing for at least 12,000 or more years. Um, now, this is their Time Capsule series, their ancient Egyptian release, and you can see it's got these really cool hieroglyphics on the front here. Uh, it comes in at 4.5% alcohol by volume, so not going to knock your head off, not going to kill you, and uh, it only comes in at 7 IBUs, obviously, because this is before the advent of hops. So, not exactly going to be a featured ingredient. So maybe a little outside of my comfort zone, but this puts it in in a real Goldilocks zone where I'm psyched about trying it. Uh, this beer also features zatar, uh, which is a blend of Egyptian spices, uh, oregano, salt, a few other things in there, uh, chamomile, uh, dom fruit, which is similar to palm fruit, um, and then of course you've got emmer. Emmerfaro and uh, free-range Egyptian yeast that are called Saccharomyces, um, Saccharomyces. I'm sorry. Uh, and the way they did that was they went out to a date farm in the shadow of the Egyptian pyramids, who's been there for Lord knows how long, and they set out dates in petri dishes, little traps, and the fruit fly, the fruit flies fed on the dates, and of course uh, they went and scooped up the petri dishes and had the wild yeast strain isolated, um, giving us this to hank it. Now, um, additionally, for more reference on proof that beer has realigned our archaeological timetable, uh, you guys could check out, uh, it's called uh, beer, How Beer Saved the World, which is a fantastic little show, um, and it points out something very great, uh, which was actually information brought to us by a local professor here at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, and and for the life of me now, I can't remember the guy's name, but this is the deal. Uh, we believe that an antibiotic called tetracycline was first discovered in 1948. Uh, let's just say it was put under intent, intelligent control in 1948. Now, uh, by serendipity or otherwise, this beer had actually been, uh, this uh, antibiotic, I should say, had actually been in wide use in ancient times, about two to three thousand years before 1948, um, in Nubia, uh, what's also known as part of Egypt. And uh, it turns out that the ancient recipe for brewing beer there uh, actually rendered tetracycline in relatively large amounts. Uh, and regularly occurred in the beer that the tribes started drinking as young as four years old. So bear in mind, this isn't today's beer. It's not 10% alcohol, blah, blah, blah. Low alcohol, good flavor. It's meant to be nutritious. It's meant to sustain you. Um, you know, with so many things that, that it took to survive in the ancient world, it seems that beer was readily available to sustain and nourish the masses. Now, in terms of Tehenkit, we find that it is now almost commonly accepted that beer was used as a payment and that those who built the pyramids weren't, in fact, slaves, but they were craftsmen. They were men who did what men and women who did what they do every day and did it because it was what they were good at, because that's what they were meant to do. Like, he was a stonemason. He, he loved working with stone. His payment he received happened to be beer and bread. Uh, so... That, all very interesting. Sorry, I wanted to get all of that in there. 
And now let's get to the good stuff. Another interesting note about Tehenkit is uh, apparently when they ran the first batch, mm, it is there. I'll be damned. Uh, it came across with a very sulfurous nose, um, and to to kind of tone that down and highlight the more earthy, herbal, spicy characteristic of the beer, what they did was they actually ended up hooking up a copper anode, and essentially. Uh, the way, to my understanding, it, it sounded as if it was almost a varying form of magnetism, whereby running this uh, slightly sulfurous-smelling beer across this copper anode, the copper attracted the sulfur, kind of filtered it out a little bit without harming the rest of the flavor profile of the beer, which I just think is fantastic. I'm getting the bread. Like, I can almost smell the hearth... Uh, this says it used ha like half baked loaves, loaves of of har hearth baked bread. It was a real big tongue twister, and uh, I can get the bread on the nose. I'm also getting kind of a drier, lightly sulfurous, but maybe it's this is hard, maybe a little herbaceous. That is super interesting. Uh, golden to almost a light brown. Uh, head broke down relatively quickly, but it's it's sticking around. It hasn't broken down to a to a, a wisping um, or a lacing. There's there's still a detectable layer of head there. Wow. Oh my God. I almost got a little bit of saffron. Um, there is so much in this beer. Um, really subtle, really mild. Um, it does taste. It, it almost tastes like it has no IBUs whatsoever. So the fact that it ranked in at seven IBUs, I, I think, is pretty amazing. I get herb, an herbaceous quality like oregano um, on the front third of the flavor profile. There's a bready characteristic to it kind of throughout. There seems to be a good amount of natural effervescence to it as well. It really carries the flavors across your mouth. It's got a great mouthfeel to it. Um, this is insanely interesting, uh, and, and this is going to pair with with an insanely wide array of foods because this offers such a unique flavor profile all its own. You could really go ahead and and pair this with heartier dishes like um, uh, broths, soups, uh, stews, uh, like a beef stew, and the the wonderfully diverse and, and lightly herbaceous quality of this beer is, is almost going to cleanse your palate and allow those two to really contrast each other and kind of stand out in full enjoyment. Um, additionally, this is going to go fantastic with um, like a diavolo, uh, certain kinds of Italian dishes, uh, perhaps a scampi, uh, marsala comes to mind uh, relatively quickly. Um, absolutely fantastic. Uh, orzo. Uh, would probably do very well. Uh, risotto, for sure. Absolutely. Um, super interesting. I, I can't I can't say enough, actually. I highly recommend it. Um, for for either the seasoned beer drinker or the, the young amateur attempting to become further beer educated, get out there, snatch up at least a bottle of this, and enjoy the experimentation, because this is something that's really, really cool, and it's something that our species has been doing for God knows how long. Um, pardon the pun. Uh, but here's to it, guys. Here's to another 10,000 years of brewing, and here's to Dogfish Head Sam. You guys did it again. Uh, that's absolutely nuts, man. That is really, really cool. And um, if you're looking for other greats out of the Time Capsule series, I highly recommend